people coming online right and left. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started and would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Designing Concrete Industrial Pavements. And uh, given the circumstances of a uh, global pandemic, we have changed a bit the way we live and how we shop. And we have not stopped shopping. However, we now get everything delivered to our house and we see an explosion of Amazon vans starting right and left, and as well as, as other types of delivery and, and mail packages. And so we've seen um, a little bit of an explosion of uh, distribution centers and industrial warehouses in Florida. Uh, Florida continues to grow. There has not been a slowdown in people moving to our beautiful, warm, sunny state that didn't have uh, a blizzard in the past week. Uh, so I think that's uh, we'll, we'll continue. And so we thought it was a, a good time to really talk about industrial pavements because um, there they have some unique uh, circumstances where you know you're not going to want to use a, a, a road design or a parking lot design. So. They, they can have uh, heavy equipment like forklifts. So today, uh, that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, there's a lot of these projects out there and we want to make sure you understand uh, a bit the nuances that are in uh, industrial pavements. So welcome. And um, I would like to say a thank you to all of our members. Go, there we go, all of our members that are making our webinars possible. So thank you to our producer members and associate members. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by Florida Concrete and Products Association. And we are representing the, the ready mix, cement aggregate and, and concrete products, um, producer members and associated businesses. So thank you to our members for making this webinar possible today. And Whoops, I skipped one there. So joining us today is Amanda Holt, and she has been working in the concrete industry for 12 years. She has lived and worked in Florida and is graduate of uh, University of Florida. And so she has, uh, Amanda and I worked together in supporting engineers in pavement design. And we, we help a lot of people around the state uh, in industrial projects, parking lot projects, um, all types of concrete projects. And so she is working for the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. But even on the national level, she is our representative here in Florida. And I'm gonna let her uh, take it away from here as our expert in um, industrial paving. So thank you, Amanda, for joining us. I turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Amy. Um, we'll go ahead and get started uh, this morning. And like Amy said, we're going to really dive into pavement designer and um, some other resources that are available for industrial design. Before we get started, I want to show you our disclaimer. And basically, this says I'm going to to uh, present this material to you in the best of my ability, but once you take it from here, it's not my responsibility what you do with it. Um, I'm sure everybody has one of those and has seen those. All right, so the topics that we're going to discuss today in, in today's webinar are seen here. This is our agenda. So a little bit on the introductions of who we are. I represent the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. We're a national trade association and we're based out of Alexandria, Virginia. And we're comprised of over 1,100 member companies across the United States and we make up about 75 to 80% of the North American production. So I explain it to, uh, to folks, the, the trucks that go round and round, um, many of those are our members and they are the ones that support us with activities like we're doing today. All right, so like Amy mentioned earlier, over the past couple of years, uh, the dependency of online order ordering and home delivering services has increased significantly. 
And really to keep up with that demand, we're seeing the business model similar to that of Amazon happening all around us. I'm um, talking with some of our members in different parts of the US. It's amazing what stores are now starting to try to, to infiltrate that type of a market. We're seeing it locally here where I am. I'm located in Tennessee, um, but we see it with, with uh, Walmart nationally coming up with their um, Amazon-like uh, prototype. And so this is really one of the driving, um, this is one of the areas that's driving the need for uh, warehouse and di distribution facilities uh, to happen. So let's take a look at the potential parties that are involved in designing of a warehouse facility. Um, for, this, for the design, the owner should supply the type of loads as well as any frequencies of these loads. If it's anticipated that there's gonna be additional growth um, so, so more vehicles will be using that pavement maybe a couple years when the, the entire site has been built out. We need to know what that growth uh, rate would be. And that way we can properly account for the total uh, amount of traffic that's going to be using this um, facility. Um, the geotechnical engineer will typically provide thickness recommendations based on traffic and soil data that's been gathered. Um, while these might be considered recommendations, I'm going to strongly um, emphasize that many civils, and I was one of those that did this, that we rely very heavily on the geotechnical recommendations. Um, if I were in person with you, I would do my air quotes of recommendations. Um, because as a, as a civil, I would, I would open up the geotech report and I would go directly to that recommendation. And many of times, that's what made it on my design plans. Um, and so your recommendations become designed pretty quickly in many cases. So it's really important that that geotech uses the appropriate guides for design. And, and we're gonna dive in specifically to one of those designs um, today. So the civil, um, they're responsible for um, signing and sealing those plans, whether or not they do the actual design. So again, um, when I was starting out, um, I grew up in Florida, um, very little concrete and parking lot type applications. Um, so I would have signed and sealed something that I really knew very little about, or I would have, if five inches was good, then eight inches was safe. And I knew that my stamp would be okay with that. So um, that's kind of the, the mentality that we want to attack today um, and, and look at that in deeper. So. In the civil, it's very important that you understand pavement design and the appropriate guides that need to be used. Um, the structural engineer, this one, um, I was when I saw this, I borrowed the slide from a, a coworker, and this kind of I scratched my head because I had never considered a structural engineer doing exterior pavement. Um, but in facilities like this, a lot of times um, the same type of traffic may be used interior and exterior. And so the, the structural engineer will maybe take the responsibility to design exterior. Typically not a good idea from, from my investigation. A lot of times those structural engineers will design this uh, like a, um, a structural slab. And so there will be heavily um, dosed with reinforcements. If we're looking at optimizing the design, which we will here in a, in a few minutes, um, that reinforcement could be a huge ticket item, and in some cases, it's not necessary. So it's not in the best interest of the, the project for the structural engineer to typically do the um, pavement design without proper guidance. As far as the contractor, the contractor um, should make sure that there's a joint plan um, before the paving day. I can't tell you how many times we've received calls and they're paving either that night or that afternoon, or if we're, if we're lucky, tomorrow, um, and a joint plan was never created. So they should be a part of the initial um, bid set. And they also wanna make sure that they review those plans before they go out to cut, um, because that could, could delay um, the, the, the uh, production. So for many years, we relied on ACI 33008 document that you see here on the screen um, for parking lot design guidance. Um, and this was the only document that was specifically for parking lots. This particular document is currently under revision, so keep an eye out for the publication um, of the new document, fingers crossed, this year. But this is what we've had to use uh, for many years. 
Unfortunately, we've seen many concrete parking lots that are designed using ASHTAR 93. Um, so while this guide for design will result in a concrete uh, pavement, it's typically going to be over-designed and it's going to cost the owner a lot more money than what was necessary. Um, if we were face-to-face, -face, I'd ask you, uh, my little trick question is, what does the H stand for in AASHTO? It's not a trick question, it's a highway. Um, so this document is really, um, is really for highway designs. And so when you, when you look at an a, um, industrial pavement um, facility, there are some similarities. You're going to have a heavy amount of, of those uh, larger trucks, but there are also a lot of differences and, and enough of differences that you need to have a different design guide. With parking lots, we typically will have a much lower um, speed. So you've got a lot of trucks, but they may be moving um, much slower. Um, you also will have a more random traffic pattern in a parking lot than you would see in a highway design. So after several years of work, the ACI 330 committee produced a guide that's specifically for industrial and trucking facilities. And you see that, that design uh, guide on the right side of your screen there. So today's discussion, we're, we're gonna base our, um, all of our talks today on this document. So if you, this is kind of your bread and butter of design, I recommend that you um, go to the ACI website and um, search the ACI 330.2 R-17 um, documents, and you can download or purchase a hard copy. So um, I'm gonna hit on a lot of the topics today kind of at a surface level. We've got a lot to talk about um, in a short period of time, but feel free to go to this document and really dig deeper into any of these subject matters. And there's a, there's a lot more that's not covered in the document I showed you earlier, the 08 design. So, if you haven't gotten this, um, I recommend that you do and read through it. So like I said, there's a lot of similarities between industrial parking lots and highways, such as the semi-truck traffic and even the paving sequences, um, but there's enough difference that we need to have our own document. So along with the standard semi-trucks that we see on the interstate, um, you're also going to be designing for a variety of other vehicle types. And so you can see some of those pictured here. Um, these are incorporated into the uh, industrial um, software that I'm gonna show you in a little bit, but we need to plan for these uh, types of vehicles because what we'll see when we run the design is a lot of times these types of vehicles will, will be the, the uh, deciding factor um, of how thick our pavement's gonna be. So let's dive into what criteria is then evaluated um, in industrial designs. And the first thing that we're gonna look at is the soils. So the modulus of subgrade reaction or the little k is the most common value that we use for soils. And the value is essentially a spring constant. So it's, it measures the force that the um, soil is pushing up, uh, um, or excuse me, upward. The California bearing ratio or the CBR is the other value that we sometimes will use in pavement design. So while most of the country uses one of or two of those, um, more likely that the K value, Florida is the only state in the entire country that I've seen so far that has used LBR. Um, and so uh, in the past couple of years that I've worked with Amy and Roger, this has been something that we've kind of debated quite a bit. Um, but we need to find a correlation between K and LBR. Um, because we currently, the, the um, software that I'll show you in a minute, the design charts that I'll show you out of that 17 document, none of those at this time reference LBR. So we need to figure out how we can correlate that. Um, Amy discovered some information in the flexible pavement design manual that Florida has um, with some direction on that correlation between LBR and CBR. And it's based on the resilient modulus. This may not be an exact... Um, uh, comparison, but at least it gets us in the ballpark. At least it gets us um, close enough that we can then take this information and enter into those design softwares. Um, if if you're interested in this um, document that Amy um, removed this information from, uh, feel free to give Amy a, a call or an email later. Um, we'll have her contact information um, at the end, so you can you can get a copy of that. All right, so we're gonna assume that everybody has the correlation between CBR or LBR and K value. 
Um, and so you're able to kind of get you back on track of using what we have available. Um, so when you, with these heavier loads that's gonna be using this industrial pavement, sometimes you might need to enhance the subgrade. And so once they, you've modified these soils in some way, then the, the K value will change. Um, and these tables are included in the 17 document and they'll pro provide you with an, an improved K or a modified K value that you can then input or use with the design charts um, uh, for, your, for your pavement design. Now, I do want to caution you about arbitrarily um, increasing your soil um, strength so that with the, with the sole purpose of reducing your thickness. There is a point where you cross the line and you can actually do damage or harm to your pavement by making your subgrade too stiff. So you wanna just be careful about um, doing that. And it also may not be the most economical um, process to go through um, for, for your site. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, designing pavements for over-the-road semi-charts or semi-trucks use the design charts that you see here. Um, and it's based on the different soil values. So this particular chart is a category D, as you can see at the top here. And so this is gonna let you know that this is for semi-trucks um, type loading uh, on, your, on your pavement. So fully loaded 18 millers. Um, the K value, this is our soil value that we just talked about, 150 PSI per inch. And so you'll find the tables that match that criteria, and then they break it down to undowed and dowelled designs. Um, I do want to um, point out the note there in the middle of the, of the two charts. This is for a 30-year design. If you're familiar with some of our other documents, the 08 document and, and whatnot, um, those designs are typically for a 20-year design. So keep that in mind when we, when we transfer over to the software here in a minute. Um, if you try to run the software at a 20-year design and you come in here and check it in the charts, you will get something different more than likely. Um, we are revising the, this document um, to include 20-year designs so that we can be more consistent. Um, and then they will, allow, they will tell you how you can go about um, increasing that um, with a, a multiplication factor to get that 30-year design. All right, so after you get the thickness from the charts that I just showed you, you'll need to work through um, punching shear and bearing checks. This is not something that was brought up in the 08 document, so this is new as far as the calculations. And so this is for situations, and you can see the picture in the upper right-hand side of your, your screen there. This is for those situations where you've um, disconnected the semi-cab from the trailer. Maybe you've got an area that you're gonna store the trailers um, before they get loaded. And when you do that, there's those two legs at the front of the um, container, and they will typically be placed down on um, real thin metal plates, um, typically just um, maybe a 12 by 12 plate, something like that. And so we need to look and evaluate the pavement section at that point. So it's a lot of weight on those very small um, plates. And so, this particular, these, these charts um, provide you um, a punching shear check at both the interior corner as well as interior joints. So the other check that you need to look at is the bearing check. And so for this one, we're just making sure that the center of the slab is not gonna crack from bending from the weight of that, um, that trailer. So when you look at the loading for a typical 18-wheeler, um, that load that we talked about is spread out in a very large area. So it's, on, it's over those 18 wheels. They're pretty long uh, vehicles. But then when you look at a, a forklift, we've got a lot of weight. It's on small tires and it's condensed into a very small area. Um, and so what we see is um, higher concentrated loads and therefore we could see a lot of damage to the pavement. Um, I did, I was working on a project in, a, in another state and forklifts were never mentioned until I, I questioned if they're going to be on there, um, on the pavement. And when they, when they answered yes, um, the pavement uh, thickness increased quite a bit um, when that was taken into consideration. So it's definitely something if there's forklifts, um, and, and we'll talk about that here, here in a minute, but how to design for those um, particular vehicles. 
So in the, the 17 document that I showed you earlier, the, um, there are two tables for the forklifts. For any type of equipment like this, you can typically Google the specifications um, for a specific forklift. So we have actually, for some sites, um, we have received pictures of forklifts and we will do our investigation and try to Google and match up as best of our ability, the model and make for that forklift. In doing so, we can typically get the um, specifications so that we can come into, excuse me, these design charts or uh, the software. Um, and you see that there's a, a table for a single wheel, um, and then there's a table for an, the axle that has the dual wheels. You'll need to run through both calculations and then see which one has a thicker section, and that's the pavement section that you'll need to design for. So in the back of this design guide is an example, and it takes um, the scenario of a very large distribution type warehouse, and it, it breaks it down into um, seven different um, parts that you may see on a typical um, section or a typical site. And then it runs through each calculation. So all the stuff that we just talked about, you can walk through um, step by step um, in the, the document. But the thing that I want to point out is if an engineer were to take worst case scenario and they were to design for the lift truck, um, the loaded lift truck, the, the design would have come out to 14 and a half inches. A lot of these sites are like, um, we'll say a million square feet exterior pavements. I can guarantee you our ready mix producers would love to give you a million square feet of 14 and a half inch thick pavement um that that would make their year um i can guarantee you that but what might happen in return in exchange is that the owner says i can't afford this project um and so they um and as you'll see here in the example um in a second on the next slide is that they default to asphalt by doing this exercise and really breaking up the site into the different areas um what you do is you're optimizing the design i do not like using the term value engineer because I think it has a negative connotation. We're not going to under-design the pavement. We're gonna design the pavement for exactly what it's used for. Um, and so in this particular example, the range, the thickness ranged from six to 14 and a half inches of concrete. So when you look at that, those areas that only needed six inches, if you put 14 and a half inches, that's significantly over-designed and that's probably a pretty penny that the owner's gonna pay out that wasn't necessary. So. Think about that when you go to do your site design, break it up to your um, different areas that might not see the same traffic and it doesn't need that, that super thick section. All right, so we've got our thickness um, design and I thought this was the next slide, but well, it's, I guess optimizing is coming in a little bit. So well, I got ahead of myself there, but um, before we get there, we need to look at jointing and jointing is a very important part of um, a successful uh, performancing, uh, a performance uh, concrete pavement. So one, one type of joint that's commonly found is the isolation joint. Isolation joints are created by putting um, isolation material between fresh concrete and any existing structure. And this material will allow the concrete, the fresh concrete to move independently um, from whatever it's being placed up against. Isolation joints are also used for areas um, where the joints don't line up. So if you think about it, if you created like a timeout sign, you're creating a T with your hands. If, if, the, if the isolation joint material is not put um, in the, the top portion of your T, then you may have some creep cracking across there if an isolation uh, material is not installed. Ideally, we would like to line up our joints so we create plus signs or crosses, but that's not always feasible. Um, and so that's an area that an isolation joint is, is used, and a lot of times it's uh, forgotten. So um, that's kind of a, a, less, a lesser known um, placement of, a, of an isolation joint. A contraction joint, also called um, a control joint. Uh, these are ones that we, joints that we control. Um, and they are used to control cracking. I like to talk about these or often refer to them as pretty cracks. We know concrete is gonna crack. So we can either have the random cracks that people um, 
you know, they have a tendency to, to kind of call somebody because their concrete broke, or you can have the pretty straight cracks, um, which we refer to as joints. So um, with conventional saws, construction joints are typically a quarter of the thickness. We're seeing some that are going as deep as a, a third of the thickness of your pavement. Um, but it, for, so for um, instance, an eight inch thick pavement, it's gonna be a cut a minimum of two inches. Timing is also critical to uh, a successful project uh, and to minimize those random cracks. So for standard uh, saws, we would uh, cut the joints between, you know, anywhere in the, the window of an eight to 12 hours after placement. Um, if you're using an early entry saw, cuts should typically be made within the um, first uh, three hours after placement, typically an hour to two hours after finishing. So when you can walk on it, um, without leaving any impressions in the concrete um, with an early entry saw. So construction joints, they're butt type joints. Um, and so they typically occur between two different placements when they butt together. And you can see that on your screen denoted by a straight line. So there's no natural load transfer between these two uh, slabs. So in areas where we have higher volumes of traffic, the truck traffic, then we will need to put some sort of a load transfer de device um, in that um, area. So as I just mentioned, load transfer de devices are needed in areas where we have higher frequency of trucks. Um, devices will minimize pumping of the subgrade and um, that in turn will minimize erosion and faulting potentials. Uh, Dallas can have a direct impact on the thickness of the pavement. When you run the software or even going back to those, those design charts that I showed you earlier, um, you'll notice if you start looking at the same soil criteria and truck volume or frequencies, you'll see typically between the dowels and the no dowels that there will be a thickness difference um, between those two designs. So it can have an, an impact on the thickness. Um, construction methods should include proper uh, positioning and alignment of the dowel um, and proper consolidation of the concrete around the dowel. So we want to make sure that it's we've got enough concrete covering so that there's no movement of the dowel um, other than what it's, it's um, required to do. So round dowels should be placed no closer than 12 inches from the intersection of any joints. And that's the location um, where we see the maximum movement caused by shrinking. And again, all of this information can be found in the, um, the load transfer device um, or the dowling section of the, the 17 uh, guide. And we typically will see plate dowels used um, both in construction and contraction joints uh, for heavy duty pavements. They can minimize your um, shrinkage restraint um, because they have compressive, uh, compressible material on the vertical faces and then they have a thin uh, bond breaker on the top and the bottom of the dowel. So again, they've got, they've got good um, details uh, within the document that can be used uh, for more information or uh, to place on your plans. Joint sealing is always a topic of, deba of debate. Um, they're typically, joints are typically sealed for two reasons, um, to keep water and incompressible material out of the joints. If you're not sure about if joint sealant should be used, if you fall in one of the categories listed here, you should absolutely um, look at sealing your joints. Now we need to make sure that your owner understands that with a sealed joint, there is maintenance involved. Typically with a, a joint that's gonna be sealed, the cut is wider than a typical saw cut um, that for an unsealed joint. And so if it's not maintained, you've got a wider opening um, that will collect um, incompressible materials and over time could build up. Um, but if you, again, if you fall in any of these categories, absolutely look at um, uh, sealing your joints. All right, so the optimizing, I kind of gave you guys a, a heads up on this, but um, as you, as I keep uh, iterating throughout this presentation, it's really important to use the appropriate guide for pavement design. Um, using the, the wrong guide or the incorrect guide may provide a design, but it's going to be unnecessarily more expensive for the owner, and we don't want that to happen. So here's a project that one of my team members worked on. This is a uh, distribution 
um, center project. Uh, the, it's 800,000 square feet under the roof and 1.2 million square feet um, exterior pavement. So uh, we've got warehouses going up like crazy around us, and that's, that seems to be a pretty typical um, site size. Um, but the Astro design, again, a highway design, uh, uh, resulted in a nine and a quarter inch thick pavement. Um, and that was too expensive. Again, they did the one size fits all the entire area. I'm sure that there's um, parking for the employees. And so it, the entire site is at this one thickness. It was too expensive. And so the owner was said, hey, I'm just going to go with an asphalt design. I know that it's going to have perpetual maintenance. I'm going to have to, um, especially in the shoving um, of the, the asphalt, you get in the areas, um, Florida, where it heats up um, quite a bit in the summer, it becomes um, a little bit more uh, pliable. You can move it around more. It's going to have a lot of maintenance associated with it. But at least I can get my site open. Um, we came to them and we said, hey, hold on. Can we do a, a new pavement design, a concrete design using the appropriate manuals? So here is a, a breakout of the site. The dark red or the, the orange color, um, that is the heavy duty area. So that was um, designed using the industrial guide. The peachy colored um, um, stripes that are going, we'll say north south there, um, those were medium duty. And the, um, the gray is standard or light duty. Those two were done using the 08 design um, that we have, so for light and medium duties. When we did the, when we used the appropriate guides, we came back with a design of seven inches for heavy duty, five and a half for medium, and four inches for light duty. Again, our ready mix producers would be happy to supply nine and a quarter inches of concrete over 1.2 million square feet. But in the end of the day, it was too expensive, so we would have been placing virtually zero. Um, the owner was able to get the material that they wanted at a significantly reduced cost because we're using just the um, concrete that's required for um, the, the design. So um, as you can see there, it was paved in concrete, owner was happy. All right, I kind of want to switch um, gears and talk about um, our design software that we have available. NRMCA, PCA, the Portland Cement Association, and the American Concrete Pavement Association, they all came together to create a web-based software program that uses ACI 330 um, in different aspects, um, all the different guides, depending on which module is, is chosen. Um, but for the uh, industrial pavements, the 17 guide was um, used. So if you go to pavementdesigner.org, um, if you've never been there before, you'll, this is the login page that you'll see. You'll need to register. Um, I can tell you that I've been registered for a couple of years and I do not receive any junk mail. So if you're worried about that, don't worry. Go ahead and give out your email address. What it does is it, it really does two things. One, it'll allow us to let you know if there's any updates happening um, to the software. The other thing it does is it allows you to store your designs within the pavement designer software. So once you register, when you come over here, this um, little icon will actually turn and it'll say my designs. Um, yeah, so it, that's where you will store all of your projects. So um, once you've logged in, um, registered and logged in, you'll come to this um, screen. And so there's three, part, there's three modules that you can choose from. You can choose from the parking, <clears throat> excuse me, the streets or the intermodal. Um, the streets can be a little bit de deceiving by that, that label because you can do a lot more in the streets. And I, and I suggest you spend a little bit of time kind of uh, exploring the software because once you get into it, it um, there's more um, options behind it. So within the streets, you can do a parking lot design. Within the streets, you can also do an overlay, a composite, um, roller compacted concrete. There's a lot of things you can design in that streets module. So kind of get in there and, and um, explore around. But whenever you touch um, the modules, uh, the screen will flip and then you'll get a description of what you're designing for. So one thing I want to point out is I, I recommend that you read the description. Um, I did not. 
And so I came back with a lot of questions that had I have read this, I would have answered them. For the intermodal, you are not designing for over the road semi trucks. So if your site has over the road semi trucks, you'll want to um, design that portion using the streets module. Um, the intermodal is for um, non over the road traffic and it says it right there. Um, and um, it's for the forklifts and, and other things. And then it also, each of these will, will show you the methodology that is used um, going on behind the scenes for calculations. So once you've selected intermodal, this is the screen that opens up, um, minus these uh, coral color stripes. So basically there's a preloaded list of um, different types of vehicles. We've got some forklifts, we've got container handlers, um, some wheel loaders, we've got lots of different equipment in here. You can either select one or multiple of the um, existing um, uh, vehicles that you're that's going to be on your site or if you do not see what you need you can add a custom vehicle over here in the right hand side you can see all of these are are um, showing you some custom vehicles that have been created um, you'll just go in and again once again you'll you'll um, search for the specifications for your particular vehicle and then you can um, uh, add the custom vehicle if you have any questions on how to do that, you can contact NRMCA um, or um, ACPA and we'd be help you, happy to walk through that with you. But once you've got your vehicles in there, you'll hit the um, pavement structure tab at the bottom right. And so it moves you to this screen. We talked early on about some of the inputs that are needed for pavement design. And one of those, <clears throat> excuse me, was your, your, your subgrade values. So like I mentioned earlier, LBR is not found um, in the software. We do have a request to get LBR added as one of the drop downs um, out of my hands. Not sure when that, when or if that will happen, but we have put the request in. Um, but for now, we've got the correlation between that and the R value. So you can select either CBR or you can select the R value and you put in your value below here and then it will calculate your MRSG value here. The next um, column of information is your concrete. Um, so I ran, a, I ran a project for Amy in Florida, um, and um, I believe I, I said, we'll say it was a 600 flexural strength um, pavement design. The engineer um, thought I meant 600 PSI compressive because they're so used to designing in compressive strength. So um, sometimes, you know, depending on who your audience is, you may want to hit the compressive strength design and put that in like it's shown here on the screen and it will calculate your flexural. Um, otherwise, you can put in, you can select the uh, flexural strength and put that design in. So the next um, uh, category that, or um, section that you want to look at is your, your pavement structure. Um, in some instances, you can put the concrete directly on the subgrade, a compacted subgrade. Um, in some cases, you will need a, um, a, another layer, whether it be um, gravel, um, a granular base, it be um, some sort of stabilized or whatnot. So you have the opportunity um, to pull down your subbase layer and choose how many additional layers you want. If you have a zero here, it's going to give you a K value, a calculated K value based on whatever has been input in this area. If you start putting layers in, this value will then change and it will be calculated based on the thickness and the type of, of subgrade uh, modifications that you make to it. If for some reason you have, you say you put in four inches or six inches of granular base and the calculated value here is not a value that you want to use. Um, you can, there's an override button over here next to it. You can click that button and then another drop down will, will um, appear and you can manually enter in the value of the K, the K value that you want to use. Um, so just, you're not, you're not stuck with what's calculated if you've been given something different. You'll select the um, design summary. Uh, on the lower right hand side and this will take you to your final screen 
what this tells me is is it we selected those two we selected a container truck and we selected a forklift in our initial screen that when we open the software um so our container truck produced a thickness of 9.6 inches and the forklift produced a thickness required of 11.3 inches the highlighted blue with the asterisk tells me that that's the uh, control vehicle and so we will need to the calculated control um, thickness is 11.3 well nobody's going to to pave to 11.3 inches so we're going to round that up to 11 and a half inches so that's what our site would need to be that is going to have this forklift traffic on it it also provides you with um, maximum joint spacing uh, opportunities you can per, um, produce some reports over in the lower right hand side so the left side, I tried to break this up so you can see it better. The left side is the full report that you'll um, that you'll generate. So you, a pop-up will occur whenever you hit the generate report. You can fill in the project description information. And then it shows you, and I, I've tried to blow it up on the right-hand side of the screen, um, the design summary. Um, it, it, it makes it, tries to make it very clear that anybody can take your, your report and reproduce what you have done in the software. Um, and then underneath of it is the pavement structure. So our pavement structure is showing um, our K value there and um, that our concrete is sitting directly on that compacted subgrade. We're using a compressive strength of 4,500 PSI with edge support. This is a toggle that you, um, it's built in in, in um, the industrial mode, but in, in the uh, streets, you have the opportunity to toggle that off. Here's our CBR that we knew and then the calculated um, flexural strength based on the compressive strength that we chose. So that's um, a run through, a real quick of the industrial um, module for the design software. I know I did that quickly and I completely ne uh, neglected the parking lot and the streets module. If you have any questions once you get in there and it sparked your interest and you'd like to use it um, for your other designs, Give me a call, give Amy a call. I know that she's done some webinars on the pavement design software. Um, we'd love to get on with you, maybe do a, a, a go to meeting so you can see our screens and we can kind of walk through um, a scenario or two. We'd love to do that with you. So finishing up the webinar here, um, I'm gonna go through some resources that we have available for you. Within the pavementdesigner.org, um, on the left-hand side, the strip that went down the side of the screen, one of the lower two um, buttons that were, was available is additional resources. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot available on there that you can go on and it takes you to other um, websites and whatnot that you can learn more information on different types of, of pavement um, materials and applications. Um, so those are all available uh, to you at pavementdesigner.org. And again, don't forget that's a free web-based um, web program, nothing to download. I also want to point out our um, paveahead.com uh, website. Um, the big red um, arrow is pointing you to the resources um, tab and you can see below, and I try to again, blow up some things that are available for you. Um, there's a lot of information there on the website that's free for you to download. Um, the manual, some of the manuals um, are, like you can see right here, this, this is the guide that we went over today. This will redirect you to ACI's website so you can purchase that. Um, but some of the specifications are free for you to download. We've got um, um, case studies as well for different types of paving um, applications. So again, all of that is available for you. Um, so feel free to kind of browse around there. And again, if there's anything that you're looking for and you can't find it, Send me an email, send Amy an email, give us a call, and we'll be happy to track it down for you because more than likely, one of us has it somewhere. Um, so I'm gonna turn this back over to Amy um, and she's gonna discuss a program that FCMPA has to offer um, with PayWise. And so uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we got a lot of questions coming in and we're gonna get to questions next. But I just wanted, so uh, Amanda showed the, the Pave Ahead website. So um, the national level has some great resources, but I also wanted to uh, jump back in here and tell you about Florida resources. 
So uh, Amanda's given us a, some really great information here this morning. However, we don't expect you to, to be experts after a one hour webinar. So we continue to provide support on your projects because uh, once you get into it, you're gonna have questions. So uh, this is, think of us as, as a free consultant. So the industry is here to support you in your projects. And whether that's industrial pavement, uh, parking lot, road, uh, whatever type of project it might be, uh, private or public, uh, we work with cities and counties, we work with the DOT. Um, so on pavewise.com, you will find a lot of resources about what's going on in Florida. And I would say most importantly, uh, in our message from this webinar is to, to give you some good information, but to also make sure that you know we are here to support you in your project. So you can uh, ask for requests, uh, uh, support on your project, and um, we will help you with that. So let's get to some of these questions. Um, so just a reminder, I know many of you already know how to ask questions, but it's right there on the side. Um, if uh, you can type in your questions, so I've, I've, they've, they've been coming in and uh, we're gonna get to as many of them as we have time for. And if we don't get to them, we will uh, follow up with um, a question and answer sheet later. So um, where, do, let's see. <clears throat> so um, back to uh, the jointing uh, part. So a question here, at the isolation joints, is it desirable to use a thickened edge? So um, thickened edges are typically seen, and there are details um, in the 08 document um, that we can give you, as well as the 17 document. So if you are in need of details, first of all, let me let me tell you that you can come to us and we can help you with those details. But we typically will see a thickened edge um, on the areas where you may not have truck traffic. Um, but you have you have vehicular traffic, and again with with an isolation joint, there's no load transfer from slab to slab. And so lighter duty traffic, you can use in a, a thickened edge. If you have an isolation joint where you're in the middle of heavy truck traffic, you need to probably look at using a um, load transfer device in that, um, that area. All right. Um, so this is a, another uh, question about the software. And um, does the software have an area for reinforcement for steel or fiber reinforcement? So under um, the streets, um, the streets module is much more um, in depth, I, I believe personally, than as far as the inputs and being able to manipulate your design. So if you go into the streets module, and again, this is only for over the road type, type vehicles, this does not really help um, in the industrial side when you're looking at the forklifts and stuff. But um, you are able to, in the streets module, you are able to toggle on and off um, the, there's a fiber um, reinforcement and then um, you can put the residual um, value in there for, for using um, fibers. Um, I had mentioned in that report about edge constraint you are able to toggle that on and off, and that will have an impact on the thickness of your pavement. Um, we know that the stresses are higher at the edge of the pavement, whether it be um, you know, at, at a joint area um, or, an unre or an unsupported edge. So if it's unsupported edge, it'll be a thicker pavement. So you have the ability to toggle that. And the streets document or the streets uh, module, it also provides you a, um, a uh, dowled and undowled design. Now you have to be careful because when you look at it, it can be deceiving because you may have a design, we'll say that six and a half inches or 6.75 inches without dowels, or excuse me, um, yeah, without dowels. But then it says if you put dowels in, you may go down to 5.75 inches. But the screen is actually shaded out. And if you were, it provides you that recommendation. So if you kind of move your mouse over it and hover over it, it'll tell you that that's not recommended. So you need to be careful that we, um, with dowels specifically, um, you know, concrete coverage over the dowel is very um, uh, important. If we don't have enough concrete coverage, you can get some cracking. 
And so we don't want to just run the module and not understand the, the output. Um, and so you need to, to kind of investigate that a little bit more. But Dowling is provided recommendation-wise in um, the Straits module. I think uh, in, in your answer to that question, you partially answered this next question, but maybe to continue to clarify that point, it, the question is why doesn't the example that you show um, give a dowel thickness for pavement over seven inches? That's a good question. Um, I, I, did, I, have, I have no control over the software. Um, so I would direct you for those questions to, um, to ACPA um, and more specifically, I'll kind of put them out there as Eric Fairby. Um, but um, there is some information in the actual 330 document, so the 17 document, on, on doweling and, um, and whatnot for those joints. So um, I would, and, and as well as fibers, fibers are also addressed in the document, the paper document. So I would, I would always, you know, kind of go and cross-reference that as well. Uh, I know one thing going through engineering school, they always said don't necessarily always trust the results without understanding them. And so that's one of those things where you can run the software, you can get the answer, but you may want to circle around and see how um, using these other factors may, may be able to manipulate your, your design criteria. All right, um, a couple questions here, going back to the beginning where you're talking about the different um, the, the tables and the documents that are coming out and being updated. Uh, so this question is, do you have a feel for what effect the 20 year life will have versus the 30 year life tables? 20 year life design will typically be a little bit thinner. Um, when we when we did, because um, I actually ran the tables multiple times, that was my summer activity. Um, but when we ran the tables, there were some that did not have um, much effect at all going from a 20 to a 30 year design or 30 to 20. So in some of those, you may see zero. Um, and I wanna say, now granted, this has been a while, um, but I wanna say, on average, you would see a quarter to a half an inch thickness um, difference between the 20 and 30 year design. There were some instances that you may have seen um, a quarter or three quarters of an inch, but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't the common factor. Typically, I would say the most common we saw was a half an inch difference. One thing that's really cool about pavementdesigner.org, the software, is uh, the analysis at the very end and, and you will be able to see in a graph um, the, the effect that the thickness has on the uh, um, design life. And sometimes that rounding, you're, so you put in the beginning that you want a 20 year design life and then the rounding up to the, to the nearest um, uh, quarter inch will actually end up giving you a 30 year design life but you will be able to see that in that analysis graph at the end. So I, I know I personally, I like to, to look at that and play around with that and be like, oh yeah, look what we actually got. So um, the software is really cool from, from that aspect. And Amy's referring to the charts that you would find in the streets and the, the, the uh, parking lot module. Um, the industrial doesn't provide you those, those, um, those charts or those graphs, unfortunately. But um, yes, that's a it's a great thing when you're discussing with an owner. You know, you may design for 20 years, and like Amy said, just in our example, you know, it was I think 11.3 inches. Well, nobody paves that way, so when they bump it up to 11.5 inches, that that point um, two inches that we did just for constructability could have potentially added on you know years that the owner wasn't really expecting. Um, so there's um, there's that sensitivity graph. There's uh, um, the subgrade. You know, if you improve your subgrade from a we'll say a, a CBR of three to a CBR of eight um, for some reason, and, you know, then um, what does that do to your pavement thickness? So there's there's instead of running the iterations, you can pull up these graphs and you can see what effect does the concrete strength have on my thickness? What effect does the, the subgrade and the design life, what are all of those factors, how do they design my, or how do they affect my design? So those are available and they are really, really helpful when communicating and talking about the pavement design. Um, another question on the, the documents at the beginning of the design table, and we talked about K values and this asks, please clarify 
uh, using k-value or composite k-value um, in the design tables? So k-value is what the um, native soils or what the geotechnical report is, is requiring for the design. So when you open up a geotech report, um, they'll give you an explanation of the soil and then um, uh, many of the reports will have a pavement section where they do the recommendations. And so when they do the re recommendations, they base it on a, a K value of, we'll say, or the, K, the soil is a K of 100 PSI per inch. Um, but we have quite a bit of truck traffic. So we're going to put, um, if so if you're going to put, you're going to just put concrete over that subgrade, then you're going to use that K value. But say that this particular project, we've got a we've got a 250 semis that we're going to um, design for. Well, when you get that many trucks going over um, the joints, there's some displacement that happens between slab to slab, and so you get a little bit of movement. And if it's not a free draining soil, we want to make sure that we reduce the uh, potential for pumping, where that subgrade is going to come up through. The, that joint. So we may put in a couple of inches of aggregate, four to six inches of aggregate. When we do that, we've taken that K of 100 and we've improved it with the value of that um, that that um, aggregate. And so in, it, we started with the K of 100 and depending on how much um, aggregate we put there, we could now be at a K of 130. And so if you do something like that to your soil or you treat it um, with cement or anything else like that, um, then it's going to change that K value, what's sitting directly kind of the support that's directly below your concrete. That's the modified K value then that you, that you would put in um, to the software or you would go into um, your design charts with that modified K. So if it's kind of like virgin soils or, you know, whatever um, it, that's recommended, that's the K value that you would use. If you've improved them at all, then you would modify that K those charts will you decide how you're going to modify it you use whichever chart is appropriate um, and then you modify or you can use the values um, and put in the the software itself thank you um, you had a couple of slides that talked about um, punching or um, point loads and the question is does pavement designer look at punching shear or bearing checks for the industrial pavements? You know, I'm not 100% sure um, on that. That would be one that I, a question that I would probably go and um, and dig in more so with, um, with ACPA, who was kind of the, the, the main head behind this um, software. That would be one that I would probably ask him. Okay. Um, a lot of times when we do the designs, the recommendations um, for a situation such like such as this, we will we will usually go through and do the checks on paper um, so that we've kind of got the step by step procedure. We have our, our way of doing it so that we can show whoever we're working with the procedure. Um, so that's kind of how we belt and suspenders the approach looking at the, the punching shear and the bearing. Um, actually, I got, I got an answer already on that. So, yeah. pavement designer uh, does not specifically look at, at punching um, in shear cracks. So, you would need to run those two, the, the exercise, um, on, on separately, somewhat like what we do um, here at NRMCA. Yeah. Green um, paper is always good. <laughs> so, to... Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this next question is, is talking about the, the parking area of an, of an industrial site or an interior slab. So I'll just preface by saying, you know, today we were specifically looking at the, the pavement or the parking area for an industrial site. We didn't really cover um, what would go into the, the slab of the, the structure. Now we can, you know, if you ask for design assistance, we'll, we'll get you the right information to help with that but uh so the next question says how about using um sra or cra additives to the mix design to increase or remove uh, contraction joints and i'm i'm wondering if that's not really more uh asking or looking at the um because i know that's an important part when you're actually looking at the structure 
And even exterior, we're seeing, um, you know, sitting on the committees for ACI, um, it's it's becoming more and more of a question um, of kind of um, expanding out what we have as our standards. Um, we try from a, from a basis pers per, um, perspective, um, we try to give go by the book, and you know, we follow ACI design manuals and design guides uh, pretty closely. That's kind of our our bible when it comes to pavement design. Um, and saying that, um, and Amy, and you know, working with you. When we start looking at some of those additives and how it affects jointing um, and things like that, strength, thickness, um, all of those can have an impact. We will typically provide you a by the book design. And then if you've got a supplier of a certain type of um, you know, admixture or whatnot, then they can typically take our recommendations and put their magic on it and modify the design for that, that particular um, scenario. But, um, you know, for the most part, the, the design guide looks at fairly plain concrete. Um, this, this industrial guide does get more in detail with, um, with doweling and fibers um, and, and even admixtures than the OA document did. And I can tell you the OA document, like I mentioned earlier, is under revision. And we've added more um, sections because I believe it's extremely small as the way it stands. But the revision of the 08 document will have more information on some of the admixtures as well as fibers and, and the effects that they can have on pushing that joint spacing farther apart and things like that. But as we stand today, we typically will stick um, pretty closely, if, if as much as possible, to the design guides. And for the most part, they're, they're pretty standard gray concrete um, you know, with, with the um, pretty typical joint pattern. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. So we, we've run over just a little bit and we still have a couple questions that we haven't got to. So I would just let everyone know that we will send out an email and it will include uh, a PDF of the presentation as well as a link to the recording. So I've had a, a, several questions about um, getting a copy of this material. So I think it's been helpful uh, information and really appreciate, Amanda, your time today and bringing that to us. And the, we'll also include in the follow-up email a question and answer document so that we can uh, give a little more information on, on some of the questions as well as answer the couple of questions that we weren't able to get to. So um, thank you everyone for attending. And we, uh, th there's uh, all of our webinars that we have done in, in the past uh, year are recorded and available on our YouTube channel, and this one will be as well. And we'll uh, continue bringing you information. Obviously, these are just uh, overview. Uh, when you get into a project, you're gonna have more specific questions. Reach out to us and we'll help you through that. So thank you, Amanda, and thank you to our audience and our members. Um, we enjoyed spending some time with you here today online. Have a great afternoon.